we have the man, the myth, the legend himself, Mr. Brendan Foster. He is a uh, British former long distance runner who founded the Great North Run. He has a bronze medal at the 10,000 meters in the 1976 Summer Olympics, gold medal in the 5,000 meters in the 1974 European Championships, gold medal in the 10,000 meters at the 1978 Commonwealth Games, and his nickname is Big Bren, despite actually being shorter than me. <laughs> at 178 centimeters, so you're two centimeters shorter. So let's kick things off with our first question. Um, so the Great North Run, it is, it is well known for being one of the biggest, biggest runs out there. You have over 50,000 people attending the Great North Run every year. Um, what we want to know is your proudest moment from the Great North Run, or a bit well, about the Great North Run. Well, my proudest moment wasn't this week. <laughs> we have 60,000 entries for the Great North Run this year. We had 60,000 adults, we had 10,000 kids. And because of the coronavirus, we announced on Monday uh, that it was canceled for this year. It's due to, it was due to be held in September. So uh, the sad news is that the Great North Run won't happen this year. Um, and that's, so it's, it's easy to talk about and think about proudest moments, but actually real moments are like moments like these. So, so it's a bit tough like everybody else in the world. We're struggling through a, a, a pandemic which is um, really wreaking havoc in the UK. So whilst we were very disappointed, we weren't in any way, in any way damaged and troubled like people who suffered from the disease and then everybody else who's suffering really badly in the whole sphere of the, in the whole world. So it's, um, it wasn't really something for me to think about great times, but great times for the Great North Run. Hopefully we'll be back again next year. Uh, and that's what I'll be thinking about. I won't be thinking about what happened in the past. I'll be thinking about how can we get them going for the future. And, 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 and that's in, in many ways how you have to tackle life, and how you have to tackle running, how you have to tackle sport. Because sport is about, is about doing as well as you can, stepping up to the plate. And in some moments, you're on top of the pile. But in many moments, you go very quickly from the top of the pile to halfway down in the bottom of the pile. And for us, we were sitting on um, the biggest ever entry for a massive event in the UK last few weeks ago. Uh, we were sitting on those massive numbers. It would have been Britain's biggest ever mass participation event. And then suddenly it's wiped out. And, and you know, people are saying to me, are you sad? Are you upset? Are you depressed? Well, no, I'm not. Because if you're an, if you're an athlete, if you've been an athlete, you've been there before because you're at the top of the pile broke the world record and then three weeks later you're limping along the road with a, with a torn hamstring or calf muscle injury and you go quickly in your mind from top of the pile to bottom of the pile and I think it's a good lesson in life so uh, I'm not spending too much time thinking about former glories I'm spending time thinking about right we're, in, we're at the bottom of the pile now what we're going to do to get back and so what we're doing right now about the Great North Run is we're trying to reimagine it so we've got a We've got, a, we've got a, um, a, a marketing approach now with all the team are working on really diligently. And it's called Great North Run Reimagined because we all know what the Great North Run was like. We all know what it looks like. We all know what it's like when like, thousands of people are in close proximity crossing the, the landmark Tyne Bridge in Newcastle and then finishing with people like Mo Farah down, down in South Shields on the coast. But we, none of us know what the Great North Run Reimagined looks like. So we've kicked off step one of Great North Run Reimagined, which is um, Great North Run Solo, which is now a challenge to all of our entrants, all 60,000, saying, OK, you can't run the Great North Run, but we've got something for you. We're going to challenge you with the Great North Run Solo virtual challenge. So you're, the challenge is to run 40 out of the 78 days between now and the due date of the Great North Run. And that's what people are doing. They're entering like crazy. All that money's going to the NHS. and we've had like 10,000 entries already in a few days about taking part in the training for the Great North Run. And then when it comes around to the Great North Run in September, the second part of Great North Run Reimagined will be, will be um, people entering a virtual Great North Run. So on September the 13th, instead of coming to us in Newcastle and running the Great North Run, people will enter the virtual Great North Run 
and run the 13.1 miles wherever they are, wherever they are in the world. And, and at that point, once they've done that, we will give them an official stamp, which can then say that you've done the Great North Run, the virtual Great North Run. And, and the reason we're doing that is because millions, 22 million pounds were due to be raised for charity this year. And with the Great North Run wiped out, that means charities lose 22 million pounds. So mm. what we've decided is give them a virtual run, give them an official stamp, and use that official stamp and the virtual run so that they can then talk to their fundraisers and say, look, I have run the Great North Run. I didn't just, just didn't happen to do it in Newcastle. So our big challenge as part of this Great North Run reimagined is to, is, to, is to throw it out there and say, you can't come to us in Newcastle. So we'll bring the Great North Run to you for one year and you can do it in your own backyard in Dubai or in... We already had Sonia O'Sullivan, a great international athlete, telling me that she's going to do hers in Melbourne, Australia. So it's, it's keeping it alive. That's what we have to do. We have to continue to encourage people to run. And so instead of thinking back about what my proudest moment was, my proudest moments are all going to be in the future. That's a great answer to that question. Just on that similar lines, but in a different category, if you like, you're quite a big mentor to a lot of top athletes. One you've just mentioned, Mo Farah. How do you, can you imagine what it would feel like to have an Olympics delayed? It's almost, well, it's never, it's happened when the, the Second World War was on, but not for a very long time since. What advice have you given to the Olympic level athletes when they get the news that something like the Olympics has been delayed for one year? Well, that's a very good question. And, and, and to be honest with you, we haven't had the Olympics cancelled in, in, in my lifetime, but we did have in 1972, we had the, um, the Munich, the, 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 the massacre in Munich, and we were busy there in Munich, training, getting ready for the Olympic Games, and we were told suddenly there's been a terrible disaster, the Israeli massacre has happened, uh, it's likely that the Olympic Games will be cancelled. And so we couldn't do anything about that, so we just sat there. But we got together as a group, and we said, look, we can't do anything about that, it's a real tragedy, but we were training to run the Olympic Games. We can't run the Olympic Games because they're going to cancel it. And we, we were all, the athletes, getting together talking, saying, look, we're here in Munich. The Games may be cancelled, but we're here to run the 1,500 metres in my case, or the 5,000 metres in your case. Uh, what we'll do is, if it's cancelled, we'll stay here, and we'll run, we'll run the race. It won't be the Olympic Games, and you won't get gold medals, but the race that we've trained for, we're going to run. So the, our plan was to run all the guys together, we're going to run a race on the training track in Munich uh, instead of the Olympic Games. But then, but then, for our sake, it was fortunate. But what happened was the Olympic Committee said, no, we won't actually postpone, the, we won't cancel the Games. We'll just miss a day and then we'll move on. So the Games were interrupted. And the reason I'm, I'm telling you that is because the mindset of an athlete is, 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 is designed not to be troubled by outside circumstances. So Mo Farah was due to run the Olympic Games uh, and defend his title this year. He's been training really hard for that. But as soon as the games were cancelled, he, he flicks into another regime, which is keep your training going, keep practicing, keep, keep training, keep doing what you do, get your, mental, get your mental hat on, start thinking about what's next. And very quickly, within a couple of days, when Mo Farah had embarked on a career in the marathon, he decided that he was going to come back and run the 10,000 metres. And instead of saying, oh, I'm all depressed and sad that the Olympic Games aren't happening this year, he said, I've got a bit more time to prepare for next year when I go back to the five and 10,000 metres. So, so what I'm, all I'm trying to say to you is that an athlete's mind is built to be resilient. The Olympic Games have been cancelled. I don't bother. It's, not, it's, 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 an, it's, a, it's a minor irritation. A minor irritation. <laughs> You, you talk a lot about the, uh, the mindset of, a, of an athlete, and I imagine the mindset is very similar then to the mindset of an, of an athlete now. Um, what we do want to know about is the difference in training. So how did you train for the Olympic Games back then when you, you, know, you didn't have training peaks, not necessarily the same level of data and technology as you do these days? How was it different? It, well, it was different because we, we didn't have modern technology. But to be perfectly honest, you, you, no, no way else had modern technology. So you were competing against guys. You're all doing similar training. They're all doing similar things now. 
And it's a case of, I'll do my training, you do your training, and let's meet on the track and see who's the best. <clears throat> Nowadays, it's, I'll train with all the mod cons that I've got, you train with all the mod cons you've got, we'll meet on the track and we'll see who's best. So time's changed in terms of uh, surround sounds changed, media's changed, lots of things changed, but when a guy runs against another guy, that hasn't changed, that's the same. So really, it's, um, you, you know, I could make great speeches and say how oh, it's all different and it used to be and it's this and that. But at the end of the day, it's, it's not as very simple. There's five good guys, any one of them could win. It's a case of like, who's going to come out on the day? Exactly the same as it is now. Five or six good guys, any one of them could win. Um, find out on the day. So at the end of, at the end of it, it's um, what hasn't changed is, is competition. Great athletes from the past were still, were, are still great athletes. Emil Zatopek won three Olympic gold medals back in the 50s. Now, his times are beaten by women now. Paula Radcliffe ran faster than Emil Zatopek did. He won three gold medals. She didn't win any. She ran faster than him. So, you know, things change. Times change. Surrounds change. But what doesn't change is, is competition. And that's the, the bit that makes the difference. You know, I was watching... A, I was watching a documentary, a series about, about Michael Jordan. And I, and I knew, and I know Michael, and I knew Michael well back in the day. And he, he's, he's renowned as the greatest basketball player ever. But when I watched the documentary, I hadn't realized, and I knew how athletic he was, and I knew what a great player he was, but I hadn't realized, even though I knew him, I hadn't realized that his main asset was his, his mental ability to compete. So he would, there would be two points behind with a one shot left and he'd take it and win it. Now that's not training, that's not modern, modern um, training aids, it's not, it's, not, it's not media, it's not online devices, it's not altitude, it's about the human mind and the competition. This guy was a competitor and he demonstrated it on many occasions. He demonstrated on thousands of occasions what a physical athlete he was, but on a very few big occasions, he demonstrated what a great competitor he was. And that's the thing that makes a difference. That's why Mo Farah's won, won four Olympic gold medals. Um, because, not because he's been the best every year, but because he's been the toughest and the strongest and the most competitive when it's mattered. So, so it's, it's about competition. It's about the mind. And it's, it's, it's not about, you know, what kind of tracksuit you wear and what kind of shoes you're wearing. And it's about taking the opportunity when the time that opportunity is presented. It's interesting. You uh, worked for Nike a little bit and were involved in sportswear as well. Have you always thought like that, that it's all in the mind? Because how did you feel when you were coming up with things to put into the running market that's going to help people to run faster, whereas deep down you know the level of athlete you are, that actually this is all in your mind? Yeah, but you, you need every, you need every, you know, you don't want, you don't want all, <laughs> you don't want hobnail boots to run in because you won't win if you wear hobnail boots. You want the latest shoes because they make, they help you run faster. So, but it's not that that makes the diff. It makes the difference between between um, winning and losing. It's 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 getting on a level playing field. It's everybody being prepared and doing the thing, and then it's about the competition. So it's it's you know if you, again if you look at if you look at um, if you look at Usain Bolt, he was fantastic. Um, uh, but he won Olympic gold medals in a world record times, but he also won gold, Olympic gold medals not in world record times because he was past his best by then, but he was still able to win because all the others would look at him and think, oh, Usain's here, he's going to beat us. And Usain used to say, well, I'm not fit enough today, but I'm going to have to beat them and I'll have to borrow one for the future. So it's, it was the mental mindset. And it was all the, all the messing about that he did. They were all saying, oh, look, he looks as good as ever, so he's probably going to win. So, so I'll... I'll tense up and be second, you know. So it's about people, it's about competition, and that's why we have the Olympic Games. So whether the Olympics is last year or this or next year, for me, it's it's it is a de it's not an it's not a minor irritant. I said minor irritant. It's a, it's a major irritant, but it's only an irritant. Yeah. So you said le level playing field there. I'm definitely interested to know your thoughts on the recent years with the Nike coming out with a shoe that other competitors couldn't match. How did you feel commentating on races where athletes were given apparently 4% more than what other athletes were given? Um, 
I, I didn't know. I mean, I, I haven't been commenting for two years, and those shoes have only come out very recently. But at the end of the day, um, <clears throat> lots of athletes are going to be competitive. If somebody's got shoes which are better, then well done tonight. You're making the shoes that are better. And if I was an athlete, if I was an athlete and there were shoes that were going to make me run faster, I'd wear those shoes. I'm not going to train hard and be like, oh, what a shame. I'm not the right shoe, so I better, I better finish fifth. <laughs> so I would have worn the shoes. <laughs> solid. Yeah, solid. And so you're, let's just move back to the mindset of the athlete. I'd like to know how you, do you think that's something that can be trained or do you think it's something that you're just born with or is it a combination of both? I think it's definitely something you're born with, but it definitely also, it's like talent. It needs to be nurtured. It needs to be trained. It needs to be refined. It needs to be changed in many cases. I mean, some athletes will tell you, I, was, I used to be this and I used to be that. And then I started thinking about the way I would approach the thing and then I would, and so psychology and, and, um, is definitely a part, part of it. There are some skilled people around who, who, who can tra help train the mind. But I think that's, that is definitely, um, you, need, you need the right mindset. And if you've got the right mindset naturally, that's fantastic. If you haven't got the right set, mindset naturally, you can help refine your mindset to give you the, the, the mindset that's needed. But the most important thing, and Michael Johnson always used to say this to me, you always judge an athlete by who he surrounds himself with. You're always judging by the quality of the coach or the advisor or the training partners. You always, when you really want to get to know how an athlete is, you know, meet his coach, listen to them talking, watch them in action, watch who he trains with, watch how he trains, watch his daily approach. Um, and it's about, it's about you, have to, you have to devise a system where you're surrounded by positive energy and you know yourself in normal life. There are some people who you're mixed with in whatever else you do. Uh, who, who add to your energy levels and add to your abilities. You have other people who you know detract from those energy levels and those and those 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 times when you're striking out to do something different. And the important thing about an athlete is you've got to surround yourself with the right people. Did you um, back when you were in your prime? Did you do any mindset training at that stage, or was it all? I imagine you must have done something along with the obviously the physical training. But did you do mindset training? Well, I didn't know it was mindset training because, you know, <laughs> I, I, I mean, I, I used to go through a rehearsal of a race, think what's going to happen if this happens. And, and I read books recently that tell you that's what you're supposed to do. So I was accidentally doing some of the, some of the right stuff. And was that intuitive? Or did, um, did I don't know. It might, have been, it might have been the fact that I had people who, um, coaches and advisors who, we talk through a race and say, what do you think is going to happen? How do you think, how are you going to run it? What are you going to do? And all that. And then the once I'd realized, once I'd agreed with what I was going to do, then I would, then I would think it through again a couple of times and just before the race goes through it. And I didn't know they were, they are nowadays, you can write books about that sort of stuff. <laughs> but I, did, I didn't know it then. The marketing now is, is ramped up on that, in that area. Um, I have a question. How did you, so you must have obviously been quite a good athlete from a very young age. How did you determine that you were a good runner and fast and progress through your career? Well, my, my ambition was to play centre forward for Newcastle. I, I've, always, <laughs> I've, always, I've, always, I've always told Alan Shearer that I wanted his, I wanted his number nine shirt, you know, uh, how lucky he was to be the centre forward that I wanted to be. But, but I was a, played football every day, every day, at school, every weekend, every Saturday. And I used to play football in the morning and then run a race for the Harriers in the afternoon. And in the Harrier races, I would finish third or fourth. But I didn't realize till one day the football match was canceled. And I ran the race in the afternoon. Instead of being third or fourth, I won it. And I realized that was because I hadn't played football in the morning. Uh, and I thought, oh, I quite like that. And in the football match, when we were getting beat one nil, sometimes I was the only one still thinking we we're going to win. And around me, the guys used to oh, we've had it now, we're going to lose. And so I realized that I was better at doing something on my own volition than in a, than in a, than a team thing. And I was a better runner than I was a footballer, so I just embarked upon that. And I got, I got gradually better, then I had some bad times, and eventually I came back and had some good times as well as bad times in later. But, but, but that was what I was happiest doing, being... Um, being, being um, 
to see how good I could be, see what I could do, see what barriers I could break, see and be as good as I could be. Probably another, probably that's in a book now as well somewhere, is it? <laughs> so what was the, how did you come up through the ranks at that point? Were you funded? Was there a pathway? Or was it just like, no, I'd like to no, go to the Olympics, here's how we do it? No, 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 it's, it's probably not a useful conversation, but we were, I mean, the sport was an amateur sport in those days. So you, you worked for a living and then you did your, your running in your spare time. So I used to run to work in the morning and run home in the evening. So that was my training. Um, and no, we weren't funded because it was an amateur sport. You weren't allowed to be funded because you, it was supposed to be, it was supposed to be an amateur sport. And in many ways it was an amateur sport, but it was a, it was, um, it was something you did because that's what you wanted to do. It was a, it was a pursuit. It was like thousands of people play golf, lots of thousands of people playing golf want to be as good as they can be playing golf. And they don't get paid for playing golf. But, um, but in, so in the same way, we wanted to be athletes and we, we, were, we wanted to be as good as we could be. And we wanted to win national events and local events and then national events and international events. So it was, a, it was a very good pathway. You could, in the north of England, you could do events in the north, east, and then you could do events in the north, and you could do events in England, and then you could do international events. So there was a, there was a good pathway. And if you, it was a very good democracy because if you, However good you were, you could go as far as you could, as you wanted, in terms of having the levels of competition on the way through. So it was a, it was, it was designed. It still is designed well. So if you're good enough, you can come through to the top. And then seeing so many athletes progress through that uh, pathway now, from you looking back as as a retired athlete, what would you, what would your main differences be, if any, from now to when you were coming through? Um, well, it's a distance running is a, is a hard sport. Uh, you have to do it every day. You have to be, you have to train um, at least twice a day for about, I would say, ten or eleven months a year. So there's no holidays, and, it, and, and unless you fit in your lifestyle, unless it's part of your life, whatever that be, um, you can't really make great progress. So you, you commit to it, and then you do, you build your life around it, and. Uh, and, and it's also, I mean, I used to train daily with guys who were, who never made international level, but they still trained every day because they wanted to be, they wanted to be two hours 20 for a marathon or 2.30 for a marathon or they wanted to run 10 miles in 50 minutes. So it was, there was lots of, the thing about running is, it's a very, it is probably the most democratic sport of all because you can go today into an event like the London Marathon. And you don't have to be well known, you don't have to be professional, but you can, you can run at the front if you want. Nobody can stop you if you're good enough. And if you train hard enough, you can, you can, you can beat Mo Farah if you want to, if you go faster than him. So there aren't many other sports where you can just <coughs> be, be amongst it. And, oh, and, uh, your nephew tried that once, didn't he? <laughs> probably, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it's you're exactly right. Actually, the, the good enough. If you're good enough, you'll you'll get to the front. Exactly yeah. as you say. What was your favourite type of session? You said you used to run home. Uh, you used to run to work and run home. What would you look forward to in your training week? Um, well, actually, it, it wasn't. It wasn't that. It was. It, it was more a case of um, making sure that your target for the week. Oh mileage and quality sessions was accomplished so if you were supposed to be running 100 miles a week or 120 miles a week and you're supposed to be doing two hard sessions in a week then that would be the, the that would be the objective so that's where you would take the satisfaction from doing the sessions that you were supposed to do plan them out do them accomplish them tick and then move on to the next because it's 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 like i've said this recently um Young athletes come and ask me what was you know, what was the session that made you a good athlete? Well, it wasn't a session that made you a good athlete. It was the it was the daily sessions that made you a good athlete. It was the daily and then weekly and then monthly additive sessions that made you a good athlete. So there's no shortcut. You kind of do one great session, say right, that's it. I've done that. I'll do this. It's a, it's a it's a it's a it's a hard sport in that it's in that it's a daily application. But it's a good sport in the, the faster you run, nobody can stop you running fast. Nobody can stop you running 
um, really fast times. Only, you know, so nobody can get in the way of your career because if you're good enough, you'll come through. So I think there's a, the, the positive is it's tough. Sorry, the positive is that you can get there. The, the downside is that it's a daily grind and it's a 10 year program. It's a five to 10 year program. You know, it's, you got to start in your, in your sort of late teens really. Um, and you've got to start, and it's additive. It's about building up your heart muscle to make it as powerful as you can. Lovely. Is there any sessions that you just absolutely dreaded when you looked in your training plan? <laughs> it's not the it's not the sessions that <laughs> it's not the sessions that you dread. It's the pace that you run at that <laughs> makes you dread. So set repetitions time, times a mile. You know, like you do three times a mile with a rep with a rest in between. Three times a mile is not a hard session. But three times a mile in four minutes and four seconds is a hard session. Um, six times 800 meters is not a hard session, but six times 800 meters in two minutes is a hard session. So it, it's not the hard sessions. It's, it's, it's the, the pace. pace, the, pace is <laughs> the curse of being so fast then. Oh, are we here? Yeah. When, um, when you started competing then and you started to be able to go around the world, where were you discovering that were your favorite places to run? Um, <laughs> this is probably going to be a boring answer, but when you're a runner, you run where you run. So in my view, you know, I, I was never, a t there were some athletes who used to go on the, when they ran, they were tourists. Uh, they would go and visit all the, all the shrines and all the, the interesting um, geographic places, but I wasn't, I just, when I run, I run. And we, you run on a track, you run on a track, you run on a country, you run on the country. So there, there, was, there, was, there was only the, good, the only good places you run were the places you run well. Yeah, so you've got good memories of the places where you ran well and probably not so good memories of the ones where it didn't go well. Yeah, and some of them weren't, weren't great cities, but if you run well, you didn't care. <clears throat> yeah. We've got some questions coming in on the Q&A panel, so we'll just move over to those. Um, Marcus asks, who did you fear the most at races and why? Well, when, when I was competing, there was a guy called Lassie Viren who won the Olympic Games, won four Olympic gold medals. And I beat him all the year and then he beat me in the Olympics. And then I beat him all the next year. And I beat him all the next year and he beat me in the, I beat him in the European Championships and then he beat me in the Olympics again. So when it came to the Olympics, Lassie Viren, who was a you know, four times Olympic champion, he was the guy I feared. Uh, he, he was a, a fearsome competitor. He had a brilliant finish in, in a race. Um, so in, in a race, he was my um, he was my nemesis in the Olympics. So he was probably the one I probably probably the one I feared. Nice. Uh, John asks, as one of the most iconic voices of British athletics, is there a standout moment in your commentary career with the BBC? Oh well, well, there were many, but there was there were there were many many times. But one of the um, one of the great races that I was fortunate to comment commentate on was in this 2000 Olympics in Sydney with Haile Gebre Selassie running against Paul Turga in the 10,000 meters, and and I knew Haile really well, um, and I was quite friendly with Paul. But but Haile was injured. He'd been injured for like three weeks leading into it, and. You know, his coach was like really nervous and um, he wasn't fit enough to win the Olympic Games. And Paul Turgut had gone close to the world record in that year. So on form, there was, you know, Paul was going to win the Olympic Games and Hailey was going to be beaten. Um, but when it came to the race, the, the, the secret for, for Paul Turgut was to force the pace so that Hailey wouldn't be able to stay with him. And if he'd done that, I think he would have won the Olympics. But because he, he didn't do that, he hung back and decided that Hailey didn't tell anybody he was injured. I, his coach told me and I knew and I spoke to Hailey. But during the race, it was slow for a long time and Hailey was still in contact, still in contact. And you knew that he was on a, like an elastic band and if the pace went quickly, then the elastic band would snap and Hailey would go out the back door. <clears throat> but the race never picked up enough, never got strong enough. And with two laps to go, I thought, hang on a minute, 
he's got a chance now. And then suddenly with about 500 metres to go, Paul Turgat started to pick the pace up and Hailey went with him. And we're thinking, oh man, he's, he's, he, can't, he can't go, he can't stay now. And then down the back straight, suddenly Hailey's like edging up to him and coming into the finishing straight. Turgat there, fit and strong and ready to win it. And Hailey just hung on and hung on and hung on. Couldn't catch Turgat until the, literally the last stride when he literally strode one stride across the line and beat Turgot. And it was a, the finish of that race was closer than the finish of the men's 100 metres. And it was the most exciting race I'd seen because I knew the circumstances and I was trying to translate that to the public. But also, the fact of the matter is the only reason Hailey won that race was because he never learned how to lose. He didn't know how to lose. And he didn't lose. And so the, the, the message for me was the mental strength of Haile Gebri Selassie was able to be the overpowering physical strength of Paul Turgat because Haile knew he always beat him and Paul knew that he always beat him even though Paul really should have won it and if he'd been more aggressive and had been more sensible in his race he would have won easily but Haile beat him because Haile's mind was stronger than Paul's mind so that was one of the great races one of the great stories and one of the great and Haile was so knackered if you like after that race he couldn't even run the 5,000 metres so you know it was a it was a great lesson in, in sports, sports psychology. You know, he, he literally, and I was fortunate to drag up a few words in the commentary saying, the only reason, when the action replayed, I said, the only reason Hailey won that race because he doesn't know how to lose. And you're obviously so involved in athletics still, but when you were commentating, was it almost a dream job for you? Or did you have to do some preparation? And did you treat it like a job? Or were you just like, I get to go and talk about my favourite thing today? To, uh, well, it was, it was actually, audience. it was... Well, no, it was, it was a, I felt the responsibility to, to know what was happening, talk to the people, find out what they were thinking. Instead of saying, this is what I think, it was best to have them tell you how they were approaching the thing. So I would speak to them before the race, um, ask them what they were planning to do and so on and so forth. And then try and, and after, after a while, because they knew I was going to um, res be respectful of what they were doing, they would tell me what they were planning and tell me if they'd been injured or tell me if they've been they were fitter than ever before and also it was a case of um my job then and the responsibility i felt was to explain as best i could to the public sitting at home watching so that they could try and understand the race because if it's just a bunch of guys running round and round it's a bit boring you know that's true actually you you <laughs> used to make them very interesting of just runners <laughs> running around in circles brooksy asks uh Please ask the following. He has, you've said in the past that you don't think you could top the moment when you commentated on Mo winning his double-double. How would you compare that feeling to the feeling that you felt in your own success compared to commentating on someone else's? Well, that's, that, that's, they're completely different. Also, I haven't got such a good memory that I can remember what that felt like <laughs> years ago. So, um, Mo, but Mo's double double was fantastic. It was a pleasure to be there, um, and and I was going to retire after the Olympics in in 2016 from the BBC, and I thought, no, he's going to come back again in 2017 in London, the World Championships, and so I decided I would stay on for one more year. And when Mo finished his track career at the 2017 World Championships in London, that was time for me to step down as well. So it was a fantastic moment, but. It, it doesn't compare because it was a, such, a long, such a long way back. One was a personal success and one was watching somebody else achieving their personal success. Nice. Brooksy also asked, <laughs> is there any rumours to the truth that Jeff Capes had a wicked 200 metre time? <laughs> that sounds like somebody knows what he's talking about. He does. Uh, yeah, yeah. Jeff Capes was a pretty shot put champion, the biggest guy you've ever seen in your life. But he was quick. And we, we were, in, in those days, in the 70s and 80s, we, were, we used to do things for a bit of fun. And Jeff challenged me once to a 200 metre race. Um, unfortunately, the 200 metre race was um, televised and Jeff beat me. So it was, a, it was funny, it was humorous, but it was, a good, it was a good advert for the sport. And people still remember it <laughs> many, many years later. Brilliant. Rachel asks, can you elaborate on the importance of training partners and who you ran with, i.e. your track session, Miles with Wilf? How important is this to your runners? I think the most important thing is you have to have a, 
you have running can be monotonous and if you do it on your own all the time um it it, it can become self-fulfilling and it can be it can be um can become ordinary i used to run with a guy called wilf wardle i used to run regularly with him he was a very very good runner and it was great to have somebody to run with all the time so i always would find people to train with they weren't competitors they weren't people who were going to run against you um be competitive in races with you but they were people who were good enough to run with you and good enough to stay with you and good enough to um to run regularly with you so and also the right kind of people around you were important the guys like i said earlier who who gave up positive energy rather than um you not rather than telling me how how difficult life was and 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 the guys that would come along and say, "Hey, good, great day today, isn't it? Let's get to, let's get going." You kind of people you know in your regular life, and that was, um, I think, that was extremely important. We see that on a Tuesday at our track session. Actually, um, it turns into just all like carnage as everyone goes off running together and tries to smash each other. <laughs> the ten k times That's are not idea, yeah. times. Yeah. Um, we have a question here. What's the best advice you would love to give to beginner runners or people starting out new to running? It would be very, that's the easiest question of all because my coach taught me that right from the beginning. You, you, have to, you have to enjoy running. You've got to go out and run at your own pace, not, not anybody else's pace. Just go out and run. And if there's somebody you, you know who run, runs a similar pace to you, go and run with them. But if you don't enjoy running, don't do it if you don't enjoy it. So learn to enjoy it. And there goes half our clients. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Brendan, I'm interested to know, did you ever run out here in the Middle East? Where was the hottest place you've run? And how did you handle that? I never ran the Middle East, but I think the hottest place I ever ran was, um, was in the Caribbean. Um, in Trinidad and in Barbados, and and yeah, it was it was um, wasn't my favourite thing running in hot weather, <laughs> which is maybe why people in that part of the world run in run in the gym. True. I wondered if you'd preferred it to running in the the cold northern winter, or whether you were uh, someone who preferred the heat a little bit more. No, I enjoyed running in the heat, but not too hot. I, no, I wouldn't enjoy running. In, I don't know what the temperature is in Dubai, but I hear it's really hot. So I wouldn't like running there. Sorry. <laughs> you asked me. Yeah, yeah, no. I was going to lead on to what you think will, what we will see at the events that are, that, sorry, just gone in Doha. How did you think they, they handled that, the runners in the athletics? Because we didn't see much, many great performances there. Do you think there was... A big reason for that, or was it the heat? Well, they did have a they did have a um, air conditioning system in that stadium, didn't they? And that's a bit unusual in that part of the world, I think. So, <clears throat> I thought I thought some of the athletics was very good there. I thought it was a bit of a um, difficult championships to to have, but I thought for the for the for the, for the Middle East to have a major international event was a good thing. Um. I have a question. Is there any running gimmick that you maybe tried in the past that you look back at now and think, why on earth did I try that? <laughs> um, no, there's no, there's no running gimmicks. But it was funny because when I was a school, I was a school teacher when I was doing it in the 70s. <clears throat> and it came to the summer holidays and I decided I would grow a moustache. I never had a moustache, so I decided to grow a moustache. So I grew this moustache and... I then ran, broke the world record for two miles. And I literally had a mustache for like two weeks. And in the middle of that two weeks, I had, you know, I broke the world record. And there was this picture of me with a, with a mustache breaking the world record for two miles. And within, as soon as I saw the picture, I said, that's it, shaved it off. And I've never had one since. But loads of people have been saying to me afterwards, oh, you've got really a mustache. Well, I, I only had a mustache for two weeks. And they never saw me with a mustache, without a mustache. But they then saw me with a moustache and said, where's it gone? So it wasn't a gimmick. And if it was, it wasn't a very good one because I didn't like it. But So, um, no, I didn't do any, there weren't any gimmicks. There weren't any gimmicks. Brilliant. World record with a moustache. <laughs> <laughs> was it your goal to beat the world record? Or did it happen 
as a consequence of a race? It was a goal. It was. A, I decided that I wanted. To, you know, I'd, I'd run. I'd run a fast time. I'd run a fast time on a different distance. Then I decided I could run. I could approach the world record for two miles. And and my big my big rival, Lassie Viren, held that world record. Um, and um, and I set off to try and break it, and I did. Amazing. Does that feel as good as winning medals? I'm old now, and this is you're talking about like a long time ago. I can't, Come I can't, on. I can't can. remember. I can't remember. Well, how did you celebrate a world record compared to how you celebrated a, a medal? Or is that why you can't remember? No, no, no. You celebrated my world record at Gator by going out for a run. <laughs> Brilliant. Good. Well, we're going to wrap things right. up. Smash and, uh, it. Well, nice to meet you. Nice to talk to you. Go Keep and celebrate. Go and celebrate Take Newcastle's care. win. All right. Okay. <laughs> Cheers. Thank you. Thank Thanks you very much for your time. Bye. Bye bye. There we go. Big Brown, I think he's still trying to leave. <laughs> <laughs> I'll help him out by removing him. <laughs> Perfect. Good. Right. Thank you very much, folks, for coming along. Sorry we started late. Um, hopefully there was, some, there was some good questions there. Hopefully you got some good answers and an insight into how professional athletics might not have changed that much to what we, to what we thought it had. Um, it seems it's all about the mind. It's all in the mind. All about the mind. Mind and moustache. I think that's the key. <laughs> that's what I learned today. <laughs> good day. And Tom Walker, you need to go shopping for some 4%, it would seem. Well, I've read some other studies earlier, mate, and actually I'm thinking of some others. Ah. <laughs> no, it does seem so. All right, guys, that's it. We'll see you next week and obviously all around Dubai and on Training Peaks and various other places. Goodbye, everyone. Thank you.